Alfa Romeo gave us a surprising shock first look into their car the other day when they went track testing with it and someone managed to grab a whole bunch of spy shots of it. And the car itself has a lot of really interesting aerodynamic details that we can talk through. In this video, we're going to do a front to back walkthrough of all the aerodynamic details that we can see from the various spy shots we've got. For those of you that are new to my channel, I was an aerodynamicist for Mercedes for the 2018, 19 and 20 Formula 1 seasons. I now work as an aerodynamics consultant designing race car aerodynamics packages for kits in all different classes all around the world. Now because there's so many interesting aerodynamic details on this car, I'd rather not give an overview at the start talking about the overall layout of the car and get right into talking about the details from the front wing through to the very interesting mid floor section and then back to the rear. Now let's start by breaking down that front wing because this has got to be the craziest one we've seen on a released car yet. Now, Alpha slash Sauber is no stranger to crazy front wings, if anyone remembers 2019 and what they brought to the first test. Now, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean their wing approach is right or wrong, but it does certainly give us a lot of stuff to work through on it. Now, I must disclaim that due to the complexity of flows around a uh, geometry this complex in terms of curvature, what I say is, is very speculative and based off past experience and what I know from airflows and curvature. Without seeing actual flow data, I couldn't know definitively what's actually going on through here. So just keep that in mind. So let's start with the basics. We've got a disconnected first element of the front wing, same as everyone else on the grid. And we've got some flat pivots that are generating some vortices, both on the inboard and some short little guys on the outboard. And that's pretty much where the similarities to other wings that we've seen ends, because there's a lot of different details on this thing and they've really been pushing the curvature limits of the rules as hard as they can. The underside of the nose must be cranked pretty heavily through the center section. We've got a fairly low front, so this first slatting element is pretty cranked and then it must whip up pretty hard by the back. If you have a look at where the heights of the trailing edges are of the inboard elements and then where we end up with the rearwards elements, it looks like we're pretty cranked along the center line. There's then two somewhat notable regions that I'd talk about. So we've got this sector here, and then we've got another sector here. Now, these are bits where I thought they might be kind of trying to mimic uh, the old school cone generation of vortices. So on the outboard portion, we've got this uh, flat pivot bracket that has a distinctly outwashing portion. If you have a look at it left to right, there's a lot of outwash on the back of that portion. And then if you have a look, we then curve the wing up here, and then we, we've obviously got some form of a sort of cone structure through here. So I would say that they're trying to spool up and house something of a vortex through this portion here to more or less mimic the, the cone style vortices that have been on previous cars. And that could be passing to, to just the inboard of the front tire, or it could be smashing into the front tire depending on where they've positioned it. And that could help with, with the squirt management or the lower wake depending on where they positioned it and where it travels downstream. On the inboard side, it looks like they've distinctly cranked this portion and backed off just here, just next to where their big old vortex generator is. So I'm thinking that they might actually be shedding some vorticity in the opposite sense to what we've been seeing on some of the other teams. I think it might be rotating that way. It's really hard to tell with these things sometimes because you don't quite know uh, the direction of the flows, but potentially they could be shedding opposite sense vorticity to everyone else. Uh, and that could be helping with a little bit of downwash outboard. Uh, and then they could be, be generating a vortex along the underside as well. Now my suspicion that their spanwise flow going this way is perhaps supported by the stays. If you have a look at the alignment of the stays uh, on the wing, which generally speaking you would align given they're in a the slot gap to the overall flow direction, they're pretty much all uh, angled so they're outwards that way. So I think there is some indication that the flow is moving spanwise outward, which would shed vorticity off this generator in that particular direction. So I think there's certainly evidence to support that not saying that I'm definitely correct there, but there is evidence for it. Then when we go to the end plate, we have a, an end plate that looks like it's the, that mid crank style that I pointed out on the McLaren, where you've got it, it cranked and, and kinked in at the trailing edge and kicked out at the top. Uh, so again, looks like we're probably preferencing an outboard position of the top vortex. Looks like we're gonna drive a bit of spanwise flow up and down off that. And it looks like we're also clearancing a bit of room to get a slightly bigger dive plane in there. 
Speaking of the dive plane, they're running an S-shaped dive plane, much like the Williams is. And I discussed this a little bit in more detail in the Williams videos. Basically, my suspicion is, is that the reason they want to do this S-shape uh, is because uh, the forwards portion of the, the dive plane, cranking that is probably where they've found performance in terms of better vortex generation for managing the wakes down the side of the car. But they have to legally shadow a certain surface here, so they, they can't just cut the dive plane here and crank it at the front, so they have to extend the whole way to the rearwards portion of the surface here. And so it looks to me like they've they've done that and gone all the way to the rearwards portion of the shadowing surface and then cut that off. So I think this is a way of legalizing a dive plane that is cranked hard as far forward as possible. There's just a quick note I want to make on the suspension. It seems that teams have divided a little bit this year on whether or not you put the steering tie rod low or high. Obviously in this scenario we have a low steering tie rod. Uh, the Aston Martin was a high steering tie rod. I think we're going to see a little bit of variance in this across the grid. Now in terms of what they could be doing with this, I would suggest that maybe they're trying to do a bit of a downwashing cascade with the lower suspension arms to help a little bit more with the, the downwash alongside the side of the tire. Uh, that would be the, the obvious thing that they would be attempting to do with this sort of geometry. Obviously having the tie rod lower adds an extra wing element, if you will, to downwash, whereas if it's higher, uh, that downwash will be less effective on the lower portions of the tire. On the outboard caked in side, they've gone with a fairly low profile caked in scoop, and it does seem that this is gonna be a little bit uh, of a design choice for teams where they go for the big scoops or the little scoops. Gonna be really interesting to see how that plays out on all the real cars. Moving a bit further rearwards again, you can see that we have some pretty huge side pod inlets compared to what we've been seeing up the grid, except for, for maybe the Williams. Uh, however, unlike the Williams, it does look like we have a bit of a smaller uh, air intake scoop at the top using that central pillar style uh, roll hoop strategy. Now let's talk a little bit about that mid floor because that for me is a very juicy part of this car. So to start with, we've got quite a conventional uh, tea tray style setup. There's no fancy double tea trays, anything like that. We've just got a normal sort of thin uh, bib and splitter. So nothing too trick there. And then on the outside, the, the barge board uh, slash outboard strake setup is a little bit different to what we've seen on other cars first. We've got this really rounded corner at the front, which compared to some of the other cars which have been rocking more of this sharp edged uh, top or they've gone full forwards with the sharp edge top. We've got this real rounded corner and we've sort of chopped it down a little bit closer to legality and I imagine that what this indicates is that any sort of vorticity that would have been coming off the top here, they're trying to minimize, trying to clean up that area. They maybe don't want the effects of that vorticity further downstream and they're trying to stop the losses coming off it. So that's what I imagine they're doing with this outer strike. But really what the most interesting part of this floor to talk about is the floor's profile and shaping itself. So what we've got is we've got this outboard portion that seems to sort of go up and be quite a, a downwashing region like that fairly aggressively. So possibly up to the legality box on the outboard portion. And then on the inboard side, which you can't really see here, but I'll show you from a different uh, angle in a bit, this leading edge on the inboard side is actually dropped quite a lot. It's quite a bit lower. So it's down here somewhere and it sits much flatter along there. Then further rearwards, we have this bulge here. Now this bulge appears to be covering uh, the cyst, the side impact structure. So I'd hazard a guess that this isn't a particularly desirable feature because obviously when we have this bulge, we have double curvature, we can get, get some losses off the back of it. We don't really want that feature. Um, but it is an indication that they're running this particular portion of the floor as low as they can on legality and then they're having to bulge uh, the rest of their structure out over the side impact structure. Let's have a look at this floor from the front view so we can talk a little bit more about the effects of the profile change. So when we zoom in from the front, what we can see is that we can just see the top edge of the floor go along here and then it drops really heavily to the inside like that. So you can see this is your, your outboard strake slash barge board there. And then this is the, the top edge of the floor profile. So you can see we've got that low centerline profile and that high outboard profile. Now there's a few different things that could be going on here. One is, is that the, the strakes that are dividing the tunnels, I can't get a great shot on them, uh, but let's say the strakes are coming through something like this. Uh, we could be cranking this outside tunnel and then trying to pressurize this inlet out here. So instead of using the barge board to manage the wake, actually manage it through the, the very downwashing nature of the outboard portion of the tunnel uh, and then pressurize the, these outboard portions of the tunnel uh, to help manage with the wake control. 
Then on the inboard side, what you do is, is that you, you go and drop that really low to really boost the suction in the center, really give it effectively an aggressive angle of attack through the floor center line. Now it's worth noting that as we pressurize the outboard section, uh, this is going to generate lift as we go leading edge up on this portion. So if we go lifting there, we need to, to go and get some downforce back in other areas. So that's one way that they could be dealing with it. The other thing that might be of note is the fact that we, we have obviously the, the inboard side uh, divots down and then sort of scoops and follows the bodywork along. So any clean air that's coming through this inboard portion, they could be feeding around the bodywork. So that might just give a really nice clean feed around the side pod because the side pod strategy on this car is again quite different to the other cars we've been seeing. The side pod itself seems to have a fairly conventional undercut through this portion here. So that's obviously being fed from that inboard side that we talked about before and then they seem to be feeding that and that would probably feed the whole way through this undercut, get your clean airflow all the way up to the rear end there, at which point maybe it will drop off the side, maybe it will start to feed into the beam wing back here. But that seems to be more or less the side pod strategy they're running. And then they're, they're keeping the rest of the pod high and it seems that they're gonna be running some sort of gilling along this portion here. So in that way, not dissimilar to the Aston Martin strategy, just a little bit less extreme on not having the big downwashing bodywork here and then just smoothly running things to the back uh, to get the, the clean airflow to the rear of the diffuser. However, the Aston Martin strategy obviously has a very different approach on the CIS where they have a, a fairly flat floor so that they don't have the CIS bulge here. Now along through this portion here, you can see that we have a, a fairly standard uh, curl in terms of we have a, a bit of a curl up here and then we have a floor edge flap that is somewhat cantilevered. I mean, I am assuming that it will have a stay further along at the front. Uh, but it basically mates into the floor at the rear and then as we go along uh, It's just going to be providing a little bit of extraction there a little bit of vorticity along the top edge and a little bit of vorticity along the edge of the curl So nothing too much to comment there. That looks pretty straightforward to me Then at the rearwards portion of the diffuser uh, we have this ramping up uh, more sort of McLaren style cutout uh, in the sidewall So we have the sidewall cutout going through there and the ramp up from the floor edge to it there uh, so this seems to be that like it, it will be a fairly common approach. The notch is certainly extremely common amongst the teams, uh, but whether you go ramp or flat uh, through the floor edge seems to be a bit of a differentiator there. And then if we look a little bit further up, what we can see is that we've actually got a push rod rear suspension, not dissimilar to what the McLaren is running. Now, as I explained in my McLaren video, I think this is not a bad choice in terms of where you would run the suspension member because it gives you a lot of clearance for the air to flow through underneath it along the top surface of the diffuser. And that seems to be a goal that most of the teams are going for, air over the top of the diffuser and feeding good air to the beam wing. Now, looking around the back here, there's nothing hugely out of the ordinary, but you can see that it is a dual element beam wing there and you also get a good shot here of the diffuser sidewall cutout and ramp to the floor edge there. You can also see the tail end of the rear cooling louvers, which you can see a little bit better in some of the more sideways bodywork shots. That's all for this analysis. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Leave a comment below on what videos you'd like to see next from me and hopefully I'll see you next time.